test to to good morning everyone my name is Chris Holsworth and I'm a volunteer with the AIA this morning in the session monitor so I'll be introducing the speakers today I first want to say thank you for joining us in the SA 205 design as a verb architects design thinking and project-based learning with 21 or 21st century teens if you didn't scan your badge as you entered the room and want continuing education credit, please do it now. You'll need a valid scan to receive credit. Programs for which you've pre-registered are encoded into your badge. Remember, if you make any changes to your schedule, drop by registration to reprint your badge. Additional resource materials for seminars this week are available for, available for download from the convention website and can also be accessed through the convention app and by using the QR codes on the signs in the back of the classrooms. You will receive a survey invitation by email to evaluate this course. Please take time to share your thoughts to help us plan for next year. Also, during the Q&A, could I ask that you please wait for the microphone um, before asking your question as this is being broadcasted over the internet. Um, now please mute your electronic devices and welcome Edmund Worthy, PhD, Sarah Jacobson, AIA, and Jennifer Mazengarb. Thank you. Hi, good morning. I'm Jen Mazengarb. I'm from the Chicago Architecture Foundation. Um, we thank you for being here this morning bright and early on this last day of the conference. We thank our online audience for join us, joining us this morning. Um, this is going to be a hopefully highly participatory session. So if you're imagining that this is the place where you're going to go and just sit in the back of the room and check your email, you, you could do that, I suppose. But we're hoping that you get to know the person next to you. We're going to be doing some activities today um, to hopefully help you start to think about how you might work with uh, teens in your own community. So I'll let my colleagues introduce themselves. We've got a Nice, some intro slides here we've got to go through. It's protected by copyright. Don't steal this. Um, you get CES credits. Um, these are the things that we're going to be talking about today in terms of solving real world design challenges with design thinking. Um, I'm from the Chicago Architecture Foundation. And we'll talk, uh, Ed's going to talk about Ace Mentor and Sarah as well. Um, and I'll let them introduce themselves. Hi, I'm Sarah Jacobson. I am an architect in Chicago, um, and I am a mentor in the ACE program, and I also volunteer with Jen at the Chicago Architecture Foundation uh, in their education group with the online Discover Design tool and the student workshops, which are live in-person workshops in Chicago. I'm Ed Worthy. Uh, I'm the, executive, the education director for the ACE mentor program, so I work with all the affiliates across the country in helping them to various projects and design education activities and surveys. And I'll be talking some about that in my presentation. And here are our objectives. It's always good to know what you're getting into before we get started. So this is uh, what we hope you come away with at the end of the day, or at the end of the morning, I should say. Um, we're ho hoping that you can see opportunities in all of this for you as AI members to engage with the types of work that we do. Um, or it just in general, uh, through K-12 programs around the country. This is actually part of the AIA National Education Poli Policy. Doesn't maybe get a lot of a noise, but we're hoping to maybe make some more noise in that area. Um, this is one of hopefully your mandates as a, as a profession. Our second goal, or our second objective is to start to look for ways um, that you can start to think like the educators in your community. And what are those connections, the similarities between the architectural design thinking that you do and also the 21st century project-based learning that's, that's happening in classrooms around the country. Third, we're going to hopefully give you some real techniques, some real tools, some real activities for engaging students and teachers in design thinking strategies. Um, we hope to have it be a good sort of lesser balance, less about what we've done and more about how you can do this in your own world. And fourth, um, we are hopefully then looking for ways that you can connect with uh, local and national teams, either through the work that we do um, or through uh, other organizations, like-minded organizations in your communities. So those are our objectives. Um, to start with, um, we'd like you to think a little bit about two questions. We'll start with one, and then we'll, we'll do the other one. Um, what is one creative solution or object that you designed as a kid or as a teenager that made your life better. And um, we're going to ask you to 
have people raise their hands and you to go around with the microphone if that's okay. Um, if you're watching online or if you're in your seat and you want to participate, we're using the hashtag on Twitter of Teens Design. So you can also submit your question or answer um, to us that way. So what's one object that you made as a kid, you designed as a kid that made your life better? Yeah. Good morning, I'm Rob from Charlotte. I finally remember pulling a piece of, or excuse me, a pair of skates apart and creating a skateboard with a piece of wood. You could get down the hill quicker to get to your neighbors. Great, and why, why, why did it make your life better? It, it was fun. It was fun, <laughs> exactly, good point, yes, good point. Somebody else, something you made as a teenager or as a kid that you designed, you solved a problem, a tree house. Uh, Sarah, what are some Redesigning things? your room. Redesigning your room. At, what did you design as a kid? At a teenager or something? Uh, graphic design. Mm, wow, okay. Somebody else, what else did you Oh, I just uh, hooked up a set of strings for my light switch so I wouldn't have to get out of bed to turn my light on. Brilliant <laughs> solution. Brilliant. And it made your life better because you could stay warm in bed, right? Yeah. Okay. Somebody else. In high school, uh, a friend and I made an audio oscillating diaphragmograph, basically, which was our own uh, sort of simplistic record player. Brilliant. I'm not sure I could make that now. <laughs> Somebody else. Something else that you designed as a kid or as a teenager. You were all designers then. You didn't magically become a designer when you got your AA title. I guarantee it. You were, you were a designer as a kid at heart. Um, so when I was a, a teenager, I did a formal garden in our little tiny backyard and with a little bird bath in the middle. I was so excited about it every time a bird went into it. But it was pretty awesome because it used to just be grass. So That's great. I was really glad my parents let me do that. You were already thinking about the client then. You were already thinking about the bird as a user. That's great. <laughs> Okay. Anything from the back of the room online that we should know about? No. Nope. The mango tree that got divided into. Oh yes. Mango tree that got divided into a crow's nest and Rapunzel's tower, and a place to hang by your knees and a place to read a book. Nice. A, a place just for you. Every every kid needs a place just for them. Yeah. Okay. How about the second question? Think about your life now as an adult, as a designer. And what's one of the most satisfying or rewarding that you've solved, solved, in, your that you've solved in your architectural why? career and why? No one's enjoying their career. No one's enjoying their career. No one's enjoying their career. No one's career. No one's solving good. Catherine's Catherine. What's the most satisfying what's design problem? What's the most satisfying I call on you. I call on you. We can call on you. We can call on you. We're good educators. We're good educators. Uh, uh, one of the more one of the more problems that we've been able to solve, or or that we've been able to solve, we're trying to solve right now is looking at um, ways that to use design thinking to to impact solutions outside of the building. So when we were looking at uh, food access in Chicago, was designing uh, a mobile solution instead of a bricks and mortar solution. Great. How about somebody else? A most satisfying design solution. Good morning, uh, Rex Barber. I'm with Engineering Ministries. Uh, all my work's international these days. I work for a nonprofit, and so about five years ago, I had a missionary come to me and goes, "We want a greenhouse in North Korea." I thought, how hard can this be? <laughs> I've been working on it for about five years. <laughs> it's a never-ending project, but it's been very satisfying. Wow, great. Thanks. We have a remote control vacuum cleaner here on the web. A remote control vacuum cleaner. That, that would be very satisfying. I could use that. Yeah. Anybody? Yes. 
Nobody in Twitter sphere, Twitter sphere has said anything yet. I keep it's, looking. It's early. For it's Twitter early. Sphere. It's early. Uh, one of our uh, projects a number of years ago was to design a high school uh, that was supposed to be on 40 acres, but only 25 was available. So uh, the final design, it ended up being a concrete school with parking on the roof and saved, we figured out that that saved the most land. Why do I point to that job, uh, that project, is because now I teach at the same school. Nice. I think all of these point to sort of two things. Um, if you think back to that design problem that you solved as a kid, um, you remember it because it was something that was not quite right in your world, whether it was not getting out of bed or trying to find a light switch or, or you saw a problem with the birds or you wanted to you know, have them around. You, you, it meant something, it was personal to you. Um, and, and I guess likewise for the second question, too, that it's so satisfying to solve something that really means something to somebody else. Um, and I think what you'll see in the types of projects that we talk about today and hopefully the types of projects that you can start to think about in working with teens, that it's got to mean something. It, um, and the, the closer it hits to home and the closer that you can engage the, the, the students, um, the more meaningful it's going to be, the more impact, the greater impact it's going to have, and the, the longer they're going to remember it. So with that, let's um, move on to our next sort of um, question here that we look at. We're going to talk a little bit about sort of the design process. Now, you use the design process every day, um, but you may not have ever sort of thought of it as a visual or sort of um, a, a, a graphic. Um, this is a diagram that we use at the Chicago Architecture Foundation where we start to think about the design process, which is um, an iterative process. It's a cyclical process that you might start at the top, but you also sort of might move in and out and back and forth. How do you define the problem? How do you collect information? How do you brainstorm? get feedback, then you might have to go back, you might have to improve on your design. Um, but this type of sort of iterative process, user-centered process, um, this sort of check and balance is, um, is the world that you know. Ed, I'll let you talk about this next one. This is a, a replication of the same process that Jen uh, just talked about, something that the National Building Museum developed when I was there. And it shows the iterative process as well as the constant process of evaluation going back and forth. Uh, and it's a constant in each of these steps. And the steps that we have here are essentially her diagram. This is a third diagram that uh, we've sort of enjoyed playing around with a little bit at the Chicago Architecture Foundation, also to think about um, the design process. Does it feel like this sometimes when you get started? Really chaotic at the beginning. Where do I go? Left, right, up, down. Oh, no, we got to backtrack. And then slowly, 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 you start to sort of get more comfortable. You get more things figured out, and it gets to be sort of a thinner, quieter line and you sort of come to that um, solution, that clarity, that focus. Um, teens, this diagram resonates with teens a lot. They, especially if they're doing the first time design project and they're nervous and they don't mm -hmm. think that they're gonna be good enough and they're so confused and you're like, okay, we're gonna design a building and it's really overwhelming. And when they see this and realize like, it's okay, I'm gonna be really super overwhelmed and I'm gonna get there in the end. So mm -hmm. this, this is something that really resonates with them because they see it and it makes sense with how they feel about where they're at when they start out on these projects. Yep. And both diagrams, I think, or all three diagrams have, have value. They show different things. The other thing that we're going to talk about later on is, you know, how do you get teens over some of those hurdles? And teens, the, the big question they always want to know is, what, what do I do next? You know what to do next. Or at least if you don't know what to do, do next, you know what questions to ask. And they don't necessarily. And so that sort of... Um, uh, process diagram is also really helpful, but this I think has an emotional uh, resonates with them. So, um, in terms of what's happening in high schools around the country, um, this is sadly the situation. <laughs> um, and we know that uh, if you look at sort of the, the picture on the left from, I don't know, circa 19, you know, 51, oh, yeah, maybe something like that, um, and today, Sadly, in many classrooms, there's not a lot of difference um, yet between what's happening. Um, 
and that's something that we want to change. This is one of my favorite quotes from Kathy Davidson, who is um, a digital learning specialist. She's at uh, Duke University. I, I love this quote. She says, we are using 19th century institutions to grill and prep and test youth on 20th century content, and we are missing the key interactive, connected, and participatory requirements of the 21st century world that we all actually live in. And I think there's a definite role in architectural and design thinking for you to play in, in helping uh, to bridge this gap at schools. We know that schools are overwhelmed, teachers are overwhelmed with so much um, uh, teaching for to a test, teaching to a standardized uh, exam throughout the year. Um, we also know that schools are, um, more and more states are, are signing on to um, the common core standards that are being adopted um, I think they're interesting that they've been so far released for English language arts and for math. Science has been released in a draft. Um, there's been lots of uh, contention around these, but they don't necessarily, they don't teach how, they, they don't prescribe how to teach. They simply pres prescribe sort of the big buckets or the big areas. Um, but there's definitely room and there's definitely um, a, a space for design thinking within these uh, uh, standards. So I would encourage you to investigate those. We'll talk a little bit more about that later. The other thing that's making news uh, in more progressive schools around the country is this notion of 21st century skills. And if you haven't heard of these, I would also encourage you to look at the 21st century um, partnership skills partnership um, website. But the 21st century skills are sort of usually thought of um, in four categories. Um, what are those skills that teens need to have beyond reading, writing, math, science, et cetera. These are skills that you use every day as, as also 21st century um, professionals. So those that we look at are um, communication, collaboration, creativity, and uh, critical thinking, those sort of four C's. Um, and obviously those are skills that you use in, in the design fields as well. Project-based learning is also uh, uh, an area that more and more um, schools are shifting to, especially those that are really um, sort of looking at 21st century skills and how those drive content and, and, and um, the types of work that they do. This is a little bit different than um, maybe the typical project you did as a, you know, fifth grader in terms of, I don't know, a report on Thomas Jefferson or something like that. Um, they're much more guided by a driving question that you see there, so that the student necessarily doesn't know the outcome to the to to where they're headed. Um, but there's a series of sort of look at this diagram. There's a big idea. There's an essential question. There's a challenge. Then there's some sort of other guiding questions that are going to sort of steer the student in the right direction, and then they're going to come up with a solution. They're going to assess if that works and then they're going to share out their work. And more and more schools are using this um, for, for good to really start to um, connect the sort of real world problem that's out there uh, that, that needs uh, that, that, the sort of that essential question, that big idea, um, and connecting it with um, a model that uses math skills, language skills, history skills, technology skills. So you know in your day of work, you don't say, now I'm using my math skills. Now I'm using my writing skills. Now I'm using my critical thinking skills. You just use them all, right? They're all mixed up. And um, that's what more and more um, progressive schools are sort of shifting to that model. And you can see the similarities here between sort of the design thinking, uh, design process model that we use in architecture and this uh, project-based learning model. So there's, a, there, there's, there's um, you speak the same language as these project-based learning teachers um, who are in K through 12. They just don't know it, they, and, and maybe you don't know it. So, so you have you have this common ground. We're going to talk next about sort of the R programs and um, how we use the design process and project-based learning. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the, about the ACE program and give you a broad overview. And then uh, Sarah will give you some more specifics about because she's hands-on, face-to-face with the kids. 
Uh, the ACE program's mission, as it states here, is to engage, excite, and enlighten high school students to pursue careers. And support con uh, consists of, continued support consists of uh, uh, scholarships that are given to students, uh, as well as uh, the uh, mentors sometimes continue the mentoring relationship uh, through, uh, as students uh, progress through college. We are um, an organization that began in the 1990s in New York and um, uh, as a collaboration of different organizations there in New York, they realized that there was a workforce shortage and it was necessary really to begin to address this workforce shortage in, in architecture, engineering, construction, and by construction I also include the skilled trades uh, where there is a, a really a very looming shortage is going to affect, uh, that is affecting the industry. Um, the in, uh, today in about uh, 64 affiliates. It started in, uh, as I said, in the mid-1990s and uh, then in 2004 we, we had a small national office and from that point on began really the national spread of, of the organization. So today we are active in 64 affiliates uh, and in uh, 38 states, the District of Columbia, and for this year, this past year, for the first time, uh, Puerto Rico. Uh, we have a, a, a program conducted entirely in Spanish and it's been uh, quite innovative and successful. Um, each of the affiliates is responsible for organizing itself, for funding itself, and for its own operations. However, the national office provides a lot of guidelines, guidance, and then also resource materials. The lifeblood of our organization are mentors. Uh, they are all volunteers who are practicing professionals. Some are retired professionals. They uh, uh, numbered last year about 2,500, working with uh, some 8,000 students across the country. Then in uh, 2011, uh, the ACE program was very fortunate to receive a uh, White House award uh, called the Presidential Award for Excellence in Mentoring in Science, Engineering, and Mathematics. And here you see uh, our the ACE godfather, Charlie Thornton, um, who um, is sort of the spark plug behind the organization. Here he received this award from uh, President Obama. The, we, we are an after-school program. Uh, they, we meet about uh, 15 to 16 sessions. Again, there is a uh, variance with the affiliates. Each session lasts about uh, two hours. And we go through the entire process of design and, and, and build. We've provided here uh, for the, the mentors work with uh, each we consist of teams. And so there's a team of students and mentors. And on average, there are probably four to five, six mentors on a team, and maybe 12 to 15 students um, uh, on, on the team. And they work together through a, uh, a process. This is helped along by a, a manual that uh, we've developed, a sort of compendium of, compendium of best practices that um, contain a lot of hands-on activities that the mentors can uh, use in a pinch, if, they necessar if necessary. They're by no means uh, uh, prescribed to use this. Uh, in fact, there's an enormous amount of, uh, of uh, creativity uh, that uh, mentors devise to recreate their own activities. All, act all our workshops uh, and sessions have a hands-on activity. This is the best way to engage teams and keep them alive and engaged in the process. Uh, and also through this process, uh, the mentors tell students directly and indirectly about their careers and about the profession. This is where a lot of the uh, learning goes on and really the ways of getting, getting uh, uh, students interested in, in these fields. Um, the process involves a realistic simulation uh, of designing a, 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 a structure of some kind. Students are often given an RFP at the beginning of a program. Uh, and they uh, work through this during the course of the 15 to 16 sessions. 
and at the conclusion they present a final uh, their final project for an audience of design professionals, industry professionals, students, and teachers, and family members. And these have a lot of deliverables uh, that are uh, mechanical plans, uh, models, uh, structural and virtual, uh, site design, other kinds of things. Uh, you might ask, so, so what uh, result has, um, has ACE had? Uh, how has it really been effective in pursuing, uh, persuading uh, students to go into architecture, engineering, and construction? Well, we've conducted surveys uh, for the past four years uh, of all the alumni who, who finished the program. Two-thirds of the students uh, go on to college and major in one of the AEC fields. Um, the ACE experience also persuades students to go into this field. Uh, we asked them, uh, how, what degree of level of interest did you have in the program uh, at the beginning, before you started? And then what level of interest did you have at the, at the end? And about 80% of those uh, students who said that they uh, had some doubt or maybe some degree of doubt about uh, going into architecture engineering profession or ultimately ended up majoring in one of those fields in college. And uh, that's sort of really uh, the proof of the pudding uh, to my way of thinking. Another thing that's uh, uh, a byproduct of the, uh, of the program but is extremely important is that they learn work-life skills. Uh, just as Jen has been talking about, uh, things like leadership, teamwork, uh, problem solving, communication of ideas graphically or orally, all these are uh, skills that they learn. And in fact, uh, when we survey alumni from, say, prior to 2009, these are the skills that really stay with them all of their, uh, all of their careers. And perhaps I think for, for, for us, uh, all of us, Sarah and everyone involved in the ACE Mentoring Program, perhaps one of the most satisfy, satisfying results is to, to see alumni of the program to return to become mentors. And we have uh, some 50 or 60 uh, of uh, our mentors across the country now and, and, and as alumni mentors, and that number is, is growing uh, every year. And finally, you might want to know what, what do the students study? Um, the 21% don't go into the don't go into the field, which is fine. As far as we, in fact, we consider them successes in the program of success because we're teaching, we're telling people, we're saving them a year of college to really, <laughs> to really uh, understand that this is not for them. Uh, so that that's not a failure. That's a success. But our other successes are we have 20, 21% going into architecture, 1% into, lands, into landscape architecture, into construction management, uh, about 2%. But the large proportion of our students go into engineering, one of the engineering, all the, all the various engineering fields that are related to the, to the design uh, industry. Uh, and then many others go into other engineering fields, such as aeronautics or biomedical engineering, other kinds of professions. So, we have 5% of the students uh, who do not go on to college immediately. 95% uh, of our students move directly from high school into college, either two-year college or, or a four-year college. And 5% either go into the skilled trades uh, or into uh, the military or uh, they begin some kind of work. So with that, <clears throat> this is sort of an overview of uh, the ACE program, and now you're going to get a little bit more closer look at it from, uh, from Sarah. Okay, so I, I've been an ACE mentor for about five years. We've led a team in the Chicago office of Gensler. And the goal of what I'm going to walk through is when we started, there was on our team of mentors, there was only one who had actually done it before. And we did, I don't think we even really knew that the best practices manual exists. So we kind of crash and burn through that first year. So hopefully there's some great tips. Um, this is about an ACE program, but really any design project that you would do with high school students, most of these lessons would apply to all of them. So as Ed said, the program runs, it's um, every school year it starts up in about October, at least in Chicago, it's a little different in each affiliate, but we start in October in Chicago and it goes through until the middle of March. Uh, when they have their final presentation and it's really a transformation as we move through the entire year. Okay, so this 
sort of the best practice type of thing that um, one of the most important things to do with this group of teens is an icebreaker at the beginning. Um, in the ACE program, there's high school students, they're coming from all across the city, so most of them don't know each other. They may know one or two other people on the team, but um, they're kids from different high schools, different backgrounds, so the first couple weeks, everyone's sort of sitting against the wall, staring at each other, kind of sniffing each other out. So the icebreaker is a really important activity. It, gets, it forces everyone to interact. Um, we always do ones that are sort of silly. Um, and make the mentors look really silly because that makes everyone comfortable. So the spaghetti hat activity is always a hit. Um, you basically just need a bunch of spaghetti and some masking tape. Uh, and the, the goal is that each you break them into teams and it's to get everyone to design the sort of tallest, um, most elaborate hat out of spaghetti that they can and have one of the mentors be the model to sit there and, yeah. and be subjected to having spaghetti taped to their head. Um, making it a competition is always great. Um, getting different teams to compete against one another. Usually, we have a few mentors on our team that always find a way to cheat somehow and find, like, didn't say you couldn't use the box to make your hat. <laughs> so um, that that's always a really effective way to get everyone to know each other, get comfortable with one another um, in a way that's pretty unthreatening. And then once you've settled in, everyone knows each other, um, it's time to start designing. And that, we, going back to that earlier diagram where it was sort of a big scribble at the beginning, all of the students tend to be really just sort of freaked out at the beginning. And they're, they're not sure, they're nervous about jumping in and starting to draw something in front of you know, architects and engineers. They're, they're worried that you're, they're not going to do a good enough job and you're going to laugh at what they're going to do. Um, and so one really useful strategy is to always break them into smaller groups. Um, three or four students in a group is a really good number to work with. A group of 15 or so, no one is willing to raise their hand, no one is willing to really get started. Um, they don't want to be singled out and just doing one-on-one -on -one is also tough too, um, but having a group of a couple students, three or four, is a really good working number. Um, they're also worried that their drawing skills, their hand sketching isn't going to be good enough. Um, and they're, they're worried, so I always bust out a piece of trace and show them how horrible my own personal sketching skills are. Um, and then they're completely comfortable after that to, to get started. Um, and so it's really just diving in and getting the pens out, getting trace out, and having everyone just start sketching out ideas. We always start with a site strategy activity. Um, it's good to pick things that the students are really familiar with, so usually our initial site planning activity is based on their own high school. Um, we get the rabel from Google Maps to download aerial views of the different high schools that our students go to. And so we, they all have a frame of reference, something they're familiar with, something they know. Uh, and then they actually know more about it than we do. And so they're able to teach us a little bit about their school and how you get to their school and what's, you know, where the good views are, or where things are noisy or where the smelly dumpsters are. And um, so getting them engaged that way with something that they really know, they can connect to that and feel a sense of ownership of it. Um, and then on the, the right-hand part of the slide, the something that we start with every week is having the students presenting back to the group um, so that everyone has a chance to present publicly, that their ideas are presented, that all of the other mentors are looking at what they have to say and, and giving them positive feedback and critique and kind of pushing them and challenging them to push their ideas a little further. Um, this one of the other secrets of engaging the teens is candy, candy or food. We, we, we in the Chicago affiliate um, provide a snack at every um, meeting, so we usually give them pizza, but candy is always a huge success. Um, and, and the hands-on activities are also really successful. So this particular one is a structural um, activity. The structural engineers in our group will walk through just the basics of structure and what a moment connection is and lateral bracing and then everyone gets let loose with gumdrops and toothpicks and note cards to try and build a structure that can resist the most, um, the most weight. And then we also weigh these to see who's the most efficient structure to what the, the strength to efficiency ratio. And this is always really fun because ultimately the structures collapse under too many textbooks and um, that's always a great time. These are also this, the range of skills that you're going to get from the students. Um, it varies a lot. So some students, and especially in Chicago, we've got very specific architectural programs in high school. So the students, those students 
are really sophisticated. They know how to make Revit models. Their visualization skills are really good. Um, they know a lot about architecture already. And some students are coming from program. There may not even be a drafting program. Um, and activities like this that are hands-on level the playing field. And so everyone, um, everyone's starting from the same place and no one feels that they're at a disadvantage to some of the other students. Again, there's competition here. That is always a good time. Um, and then it's something that seems to be a surprise to many of the students at first is that the iteration of the design process that you have to keep kind of going back and changing something and that what you start off with at the beginning is maybe not the best thing immediately. Um, and so constantly being challenged and having to keep going back and rethinking about your design and explaining why you want to do something, um, why you're designing a building, not just because it looks cool. And so again, you can see in these pictures, we're broken into smaller groups, but everyone is sort of moving between the groups. So they're, um, and we've found that it's, there's a couple different ways to work. We've got 15 to 20 students usually all working to solve one design problem. Um, which can be challenging. That's a lot of cooks in the kitchen. Um, we've tried breaking the, the building or the campus down into a couple different things and having different students work on one part of the, the overall project and they would be responsible for every part of that building. Other times we've tried to break it up where there's a team of students who are working on the facade, a different team that'll be working on the site. Um, it's been mixed success either way. It's just finding a way for each student to sort of have ownership of one part of something, um, but making sure they collaborate and they, they realize that architecture design isn't a solitary pursuit when you've got a whole team, not just of other architects, but of engineers and contractors um, and looking at the whole perspective. And so it's, it's a big messy process and it's getting everyone comfortable with that and, and it's messy, literally messy. Um, which brings us to model building, which is a really, physical model building is a really, really successful way to get teams engaged. Um, again, this is something that levels the playing field. Almost no one has really strong model building skills when they start. I highly, highly advise starting with an exacto training class. You don't want to lose any <laughs> fingers. Um, also really protecting the work surface in your office if you're going to be doing this. You don't want things glued to the conference room table. Um, but this is this is something the students are really engaged in. Everyone wants to make a model. They have a great time with it. Um, it you know, a quick introductory class of how you scale and, and cutting pieces out. It can be really inexpensive, although the students really embrace crazy model making materials. So they love to bring in tin foil and spray painted bits of cotton and just there there's some crazy looking models that they come up with. But they are really proud of them and they're really into it and it's really exciting for them to see what they're thinking about take on three dimensions and something they can pick up and look at and, and study. Um, so that's that's always a really successful part of the project. It's harder to get people to just lay out the plans. And then the final presentation is a huge, um, it's always, it's really satisfying as a mentor to see the accomplishment that the teens have over the year. I'm always surprised we have all of our, all of our students in our group, we make sure that everyone talks for at least a sentence or two in their presentation. And in the weeks leading up to it, we always do a dress rehearsal in our office in front of other architects. And it's like pulling teeth to get anyone to agree that they're gonna speak. But then we get to the final presentation and you cannot shut these kids up. They just keep talking about their project. They're always running on, we have to pull them off the stage. They're just, they're really proud of what they've done. They always battle over who gets to keep the boards that we present and, um, you know, at this presentation, that's where scholarships are, are given away, internships are awarded, and it's it's really rewarding. It's there's so much satisfaction for these kids. They're really proud of what they've accomplished. Anymore. And they, I mean, they, I'm always really proud of what they managed to accomplish. Um, Thanks for joining us for SIU. And then this last slide is another activity that the Chicago chapter has started. I think for the past three, I think this is our third year, maybe the fourth year. Um, that during, in addition to the internships, there is a program we've done in conjunction with Chicago Public Schools that's a design build program for the summer. And these students are actually paid um, an hourly rate. It's not a tremendous amount of money, but, um, and it's for six weeks or so in the summer, they come up with a design project. This particular one, I believe it was just a sun shelter in a park, but they're a fairly simple project. They come up with the design, 
Um, they develop the construction documents, and then they actually build the project all within the span of the one summer. There's a few mentors who volunteer their time during the workday during the summer um, to make this project su a success. And this is something that um, is a huge accomplishment for these students and to have into their portfolios if they're going into architecture school that they've actually already designed and built a project before they're ready to start college. Um, so I guess that's that's leading off to Jen, but those are some of the concrete tips of anything engaging with teams. Thanks, sir. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, the Chicago Architecture Foundation's newest um, K-12 resource. It's called discoverdesign.org. As you can see from the slide, it's the digital learning tool that connects teens and mentors uh, and teachers for design challenges. Um, if, for a little background on the Chicago Architecture Foundation, we are um, a, a nonprofit organization, obviously. Um, we are not the AIA uh, Chicago um, affiliate or, 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 or um, philanthropic arm. We, we are our own separate organization, although we work very closely with AIA Chicago. Um, but our mission is to inspire the public why, to, to understand why design matters. And so we do that through a variety of programming, um, everything from um, public tours, the architecture river crews, walking tours, um, uh, workshops, lectures, exhibitions, uh, K through 12 teacher and student programs, um, a variety of ways to engage the public uh, with, um, with built environment issues. We've been around since 1966 as an organization. Um, and we have our, our hallmark, our largest um, sort of unique feature is that we have 450 our, um, 450 docents who volunteer to give all of our tours. And so they give about 5,000 tour departures a year of Chicago. We have um, a history in, at CAF of developing um, K-12 uh, resources. On the left is Schoolyards to Skylines, Teaching with Chicago's Amazing Architecture. It was published in 2002. Uh, and it is a K-8 resource book for teachers on using architecture to teach the core subjects, to teach math, science, language arts, fine arts, and social studies. On the right is the Architecture Handbook, a student guide to understanding buildings. And the Architecture Handbook was published in 2007. It is, to our knowledge, the first and only high school architecture textbook in the nation. There's a student edition that you see there, a teacher edition in the back, uh, and it's used in uh, approximately 350 uh, high uh, schools around the country, um, and it's the official text in the Chicago Public Schools as well. But it's that sort of primer, that sort of 101 um, text. And we knew that the architecture handbook is primarily being used in that sort of sophomore, junior level of schools, that like, <laughs> sort of 101 level. Um, but we knew from talking with teachers and students that we needed something for that next level, for juniors and seniors. Um, what are ways, once the student has the ability to read a drawing, once they have some basic sort of architectural literacy, what comes next? And so we uh, created a, a digital learning tool uh, called discoverdesign.org. There's Sarah in the right-hand corner of the photo um, that sort of helps uh, to connect to these audiences. Um, we knew that teens were not talking to each other about architecture. We also knew that architecture drafting teachers, architectural design teachers in high schools were not talking to each other. And more importantly, I think for our conversation today, we also know that across the country, for the most part, the architectural profession isn't talking to teens as, and, and high schools as much as they, as they could be. And so these kids are sort of marching through you know, a two-year or three-year sequence in their high school learning um, some fabulous you know, uh, software skills, but not having the bigger sort of architectural thinking uh, context, not having a lot of uh, connection with mentors, with the architecture profession, and so how do we um, uh, connect them? So we built this basically social networking tool for teens uh, and uh, around architecture. It's got currently about 8,000 registered users from around the country. It's used in schools, it's used after schools, it's used by the geeky kid at, you know, in their, in their bedroom in the evening, it's used by international students. Um, and uh, to, with this mission of connecting teens, teachers, and, and architects around the country for project-based learning. Um, we're very pleased that yesterday we were awarded the AIA um, uh, National Honor Award for Collaborative Achievement. 
Um, this recognizes, this is a category of, of, of awards that AIA um, gives to basically not buildings and not people, but it's that, those sort of other things that, that promote uh, and support the profession. And um, we, we're, we were, received this award with two other organizations uh, yesterday. And, um, and also that the other two publications that we produced, the Architecture Handbook and Scalier's Discount, also won the same collaborative achievement award in years past, which was very exciting. So here's the homepage of um, discoverdesign.org. You can see that sort of it has these four tabs across the top. Um, students are discovering architecture, they're choosing a design problem, a design project of their own, and then they're sharing their work in the student gallery. And the student is uploading their work in the steps of the design process that they've been that has sort of been modeled for them. We're going to um, show sort of show how that works here in a second. So in the first tab of of uh, discovering architecture, we look at sort of seven um, seven uh, sort of key ideas in architecture: um, how the building is related to its society, the neighborhood around it, the site, the spaces, the systems, the structure, the skin, and then all the stuff of the building. And we partnered with um, six architecture firms around the country. Um, we chose their uh, designs for school buildings, uh, and we used those school buildings as case studies. So this happens to be the Nueva School. Um, this is a Letty Madam Stacy building uh, out of San Francisco area. We par partnered with Perkins and Will and Malum and Canon Design and um, uh, Letty Madam Stacy, as I mentioned, John Ronan Architects. And um, we looked at, um, we, we got them to give us their drawings of all these buildings. And so we showed you know, everything from the early sort of napkin sketches or, or trace sketches of the architects all the way through the construction do uh, drawings. We did video interviews with the architects. Um, and we're sort of walking the student through the design process of how uh, these architects have solved the problem. Then the next step is then the student chooses a design project. Um, that we post everything from a small project, which might be redesigning their locker, up to a large project, which might be a new technology wing. They're all based on schools. The case studies are schools. All the design projects are schools. And that's on purpose, because sort of going back to my earlier question of what design projects matter to you, those that you remember from your childhood, or those that mean something to you today, it's because they, you had that personal connection with them. Um, for the most part, we aren't asking students to design something that they aren't familiar with. In Chicago, our kids know skyscrapers because they're sort of around them. But, you know, if you're in rural Montana, you know, it doesn't make sense to have a kid design a skyscraper. As much as that cool, that might be a cool thing to do, they just, they don't have, they, they don't know what's wrong, they don't know what's right, they don't have any sort of um, experience with that building type. So we've chosen schools as the, as the theme because Gosh, the kids know what they hate and what they love. Yes. And if you are designing schools and you haven't talked to a 16-year-old lately, you should please do that. Um, because they have such passionate feelings about things. And that's, that's, that's the impetus, right? If there's something that bugs them, they want to fix it. They want to make it better. Um, and so uh, they tackle school design projects. Small, large, medium, extra large. There's a place to post their work. Um, these are um, some, this is the student gallery that we're looking at here. And unlike maybe a typical website, uh, even like Facebook or Flickr or something like that, where they're just sort of posting their final, ta-da, here's my final project, isn't it beautiful? They post it in the steps of the design process. And this, Sarah mentioned this, that this is surprising for a lot of kids <laughs> because they think, they think that you sit down the night before and you draw it up and then it gets built. And we know that's not what happens, right? That's not at all what happens. Um, but that's what the kids think. And so we're sort of slowing that process down and stretching it out and having them upload work in, here's how, here's my problem I'm trying to solve. Here's how I've collected information. Here's how I've brainstormed and developed solutions in, in my final design. But this is not unlike for a high school student, what they're doing in their math class when the geometry teacher says, show your work or the trigonometry teacher says, I don't care about the final answer. I do, maybe, but I also <laughs> want to see how you got there. Um, or the English teacher that says, I don't want to just see you write the paper the night before and turn it in. I want to see the outline. I want to see your note cards. I want to see your rough draft. And this is uncomfortable for a 16-year-old because they want to do it the night before and turn it in and think it's perfect. So um, it's, a good, it's a good life skill to learn. 
So they, they upload their work, their videos, their models, their text in the stages of, these, of the process. You can sort of see them working through here. This was um, last year, uh, we ran a, a national competition last year and this year, um, uh, last year was a cafeteria design project, this year was a library design project, um, and this is the winner from last year. And I know you can't read this, but this sort of sees, you can sort of see the commentary going back and forth here. So the student is asking, a, a, another student, a peer around the country is asking a, a question of the student, and there's Sarah's response in the middle, I think, um, of another sort of, um, uh, you know, an architect's perspective, and then the teacher says something, and then the kid around the country appears, and then the kid at the next desk says something, and there's this great dialogue that happens um, around the, the solution that the kid is proposing. And I would even have been that. The, it's amazing the projects that you're commenting on when they're in process, that the students really take to heart things that an architect comments on, and they make dramatic changes, and they ask great questions, and they are really engaged by it by getting that kind of response and knowing that someone else is looking at it other than just their teacher. Yeah. So Discovery Design is used, um, like I said, we have about 8,000 8, registered users. We had um, roughly about 400 projects submitted for this year's competition that we ran. Um, it's open, it's free to for anybody to use. Any teacher can jump in at any point throughout the year. Any mentor, all of you could sign up and create accounts and, and, and follow projects and, and mentor students. Um, along, you can mentor in your pajamas at midnight. How many other opportunities do you have to do that, to mentor in, at, at midnight? Um, but yes, it's, it's been, it's been um, a success, but we also, there's definitely room to grow. So, in this next section, um, we're going to sort of start to maybe talk and hear from you a little bit and talk, talk from us a little bit about, um, we're going to look at three questions here. So, I think. You're asking the first one? You're asking I'm asking the first one. Question. So the first question to both Jen and Ed is, how do you choose an appropriate and meaningful design project for teens? For the, if you're, if everyone's out there going to set their inputs, mm -hmm. some tips and that's where to do that. I guess I'll start with Jen. I guess I sort of maybe cut to this a little bit <laughs> earlier, but I, I think it's, it's got to be something that the kids can relate to. Um, it's got to be a, a building type that you can go visit, um, that they can see other examples of in their world, um, that maybe your firm specializes in, perhaps. But um, they, the, the kid, it has to be approachable. It has to be something that um, the kids have experience with, I think, for it, for it to matter, and something that that, that um, resonates and is meaningful for them. And to add to that, I think uh, there needs to be opportunities for flights of fancy. Uh, and for uh, imagination, because kids love to think big and wild, uh, and for them not to, not to be totally contained and restrained from doing that. Uh, so that's a challenge to match that. This on one hand with what Jen was saying, really a building type that something is recognizable and real. Uh, but uh, mm -hmm. by combining the two, I think you'll get a lot of, of uh, uh, interest and excitement with students. A convention center would be something that would be totally outside the realm of a kid, right? Like uh, an airport, you know, I mean, like those are just building types that the, the kid isn't experiencing every day. So don't have them design convention centers. Yes. Uh, and the, the touching on the idea that um, letting them have fun, we'd never on any of the projects really hold them to any codes of law or budgets or... Gravity. If gravity <laughs> with the structural engineers will do that, but I mean, we get some crazy ideas of you know rock climbing walls on the side of a skyscraper, 40 stories up. <laughs> there was um, a shark tank that was uh, in this in the cafeteria was a needed shark tank. Oh, the human hamster wheel is what I meant. So it was a way to generate energy and stimulate activity. Was a giant human hamster wheel. So they're crazy, crazy ideas, but. Those are the ones that the kids really latch on to, and they really get into it, and they really solve it as a design problem. It may be kind of ridiculous, but that um, engages them, and that's really the most important part of it, not that it's a wonderfully, beautifully sophisticated design in the end. This is your question. So then what types, and this is for Jen and, and uh, uh, Sarah, what types of drawings and images and models uh, can teens typically produce? Sarah, I think you've got some pictures. Yeah, we've got a ton of slides from them. And the, the range is really 
um, it's all over the place. And it's, it's about sort of just figuring out what the comfort level is of the students that you're working with um, and having them do whatever they're going to thrive with. So we've got some students, these are some hand sketches. Um, that this was a particular student that we had who had no architectural training whatsoever. He just stumbled across the ACE program and joined us, but he would just sit down and work. I mean, there were really beautiful pencil drawings that he slaved over for weeks. Um, SketchUp is, is a great tool. They love SketchUp. The kids, it's something they can download free at home to work on. Um, and they'll work on that at school. The Just the hand drawing. Visualization is great. Photoshop is something. They, the kids love doing a crash course in Photoshop and getting to drop people in and other kind of crazy stuff. Um, we've also found that engaging um, material selection and looking at palettes, taking them into your office's library and letting them pick out carpet samples or tile samples or glass samples. Fascinating. And, and getting that hands on and picking those, that is, making a palette is always a great thing to do. So these are all drawings that the students have drawn completely on their own. Um, you know, we've shown them a couple tips or tricks, but this is what they go with, which is why you get crazy spinning towers and a brain program in your high school. I think one, one point also that we are continually surprised at is that you might be working with a teenager and you might feel like, oh, God, we got to teach them like this whole course on Revit or a whole course on yeah. SketchUp. They pick it up like that, like that. Yeah. And the, the, the time that it took for you to learn the software, like cut it in a quarter and that's as long as it will take them. They don't need a manual. They just figure it out. This is the, yeah. this is the, the age of, they've been playing video games their whole life. They don't, they don't need instruction manuals. They just figure it out. They might need your guidance in terms of like what to do with it or how that drawing is represented or what it means. That's what you provide. You provide that meaning for things and, and that sort of um, context. But don't worry about teaching them software because they, they got that. They can yep. figure that out really quickly. And this, I mean, this was a RAM model that one of the users, the structural engineers, worked with the students on developing us to do the analysis. And that, I mean, this was amazing to them that they could see this. They could apply forces to it. They would see how that would react. They could take structure in and out. Um, just collaging, taking their Photoshop models, working with them, in, uh, or their SketchUp models, putting them into Photoshop. And yeah, the, as you can see, the buildings, the stuff gets crazy. Um, but with a little bit of guidance and showing them examples of other things that students have done. Um, they always want to do better than the previous years. You can see here, this was one with the human hamster wheel featured into our, <laughs> our site. Um, they have a lot of fun with Photoshop and scouring little blow up creatures they can put on there. What, what, what do you think is important for uh, the students to do both physical models as well as virtual models? Some of the mentors really strongly emphasize the importance of physically working with your hands and making a model. I think that's a really, that's a really easy, not easy is the right word, but it's a great way to get everyone engaged. One of the challenges of working on the computer is that you, you can't fit six people around one computer. It's tough to do that. Um, the, when, once we move into the phase where we're doing computer modeling, it's pretty much one mentor to one student, maybe two students sitting at a desk, and so it's tough to have everyone working together and collaboratively designing the physical model. We can have everyone in the room working on it, building different sections, checking pieces, so that that's a great way to get everyone in the space engaged. Um, but in terms of learning, which is more important or, or both important? Oh, I think that they're they're both important. I mean, the, the if you're going to do physical models, a crash course, uh, a crash course on scale and, and what quarter inch to a foot means and that we're all building something at the same scale and how to, being really careful with measuring because we've definitely cut everything out and tried to put it together and had a disaster on our hands. Okay. Our third question, which I won't go back to, but I'll just read. Um, the third question is, how do you provide constructive criticism and encouragement to this audience, to this, to this age group of teens? Thoughts on that experience? Well, I think you have to combine both. Mm -hmm. uh, you can't be, um, uh, your, your, your criticism cannot be pablum for them, I mean, because they can see through that. They really need to know that you know, this is a really meaningful criticism, but uh, at the same time, they need to be encouraged to move on to the next, next step and be able to think through this. But they're eager, extremely eager to uh, get feedback for the most part.
And I think it's really important to challenge them, to expect more out of them and say, yeah, this is great. You've got a great start here. And I like, you know, finding one element that's the strongest about something, but saying you still need to do this, this, and this, and think about these other things um, to push them to push them forward and um, make sure that they're, you know, it's it takes a long time to get comfortable with designing something, but just constantly pushing them to do a little bit more and not just letting them off the hook, saying, "Wow, you made a whole Revit model. That's amazing. Great. I don't expect anything more out of you." It's like, okay, fine, but what's the design concept behind this? And, but I think also in the criticism, you don't want to provide the answers. You want to challenge and to really stimulate them to, to think through the process of the issues themselves. I think that one of the most typical responses when you talk to teens is, you know, if you sort of ask, them, well, why did you choose to do that? Why, why did you do that, um, make that design decision? They might resort to, I don't know, it looked cool. <laughs> and we know that, that you, you, you can push deeper. You can, you can ask them to go beyond, it looks cool. Um, and to provide some rationale. It could be that it's a flight of fancy, it could be that it's a real issue, but, um, but to, to, to get them to articulate their, their thinking, their thought process, I think is really key too. I guess the only a small thing I'll add to this is, we know that this age group doesn't like to fail publicly. Teens, I mean, none of us like to fail publicly, of course, but especially for teenagers, um, they want to be conforming non-conformists. They want to stand out, but they want to blend in. And so sometimes it's easier to do things, as Sarah said, as a group, to provide that constructive criticism, not who did this drawing, and not to single them out, but to think about like the team um, and, and, and praising the team together and, and then uh, providing constructive criticism for the team together so that you're not singling um, the students out because um, that they will resist kind of yes. future communication. And, Creating an environment where it's okay to make mistakes and showing them, I mean, I always will show them like, oh, here's something I totally screwed up on and showing them that things, like it's okay, it's, that's part of this process. You're gonna make mistakes, things are not gonna turn out right. You need to but start But this is over. what we started with. I right. thought the building would look like, and this is how it ended up, and it was completely different. And they, that's, just quitting the Roy, it's okay. If you make a mistake, it's not a failure. That's part of this process, and we're gonna keep going, and it's okay. Mm -hmm. Great, okay. So our next um, activity that we're gonna work through is um, a small group activity. And what we'd like you to do, for those of you that are sitting sort of as islands, is to <laughs> slide over next to somebody, uh, another Not person, drift. Just a drift over next to somebody. We're gonna have um, a, a discussion and we're gonna have you actually report back. So what we're going to do here is um, go through a series of questions that you might ask yourself if you are thinking about your local population of teens that you might work with. This might be, um, uh, you know, you, the high school down the road that you work with, or it's something that you, place that you teach, for example, the, your, your alma mater, um, or maybe you're thinking about um, joining forces with an ACE mentor team or with um, us uh, through discoverdesign.org, but thinking about um, how, how do you create meaningful design projects for teens and what are the things that you need to think about. Um, for those of you that are online, this is all these questions also appear in a PDF um, handout that's um, as part of the presentation that you can download. Um, so step one is, so okay, everybody, let's do that now. And you'll need maybe hopefully something to write with, some notes or something. If you can slide one way or the other and just find at least somebody else to talk to. Meet your neighbors. Meet your neighbors. Introduce yourself. Don't be shy like teenagers. That's just right. Don't be shy. I'll make you wear a spaghetti hat. <laughs> and again, for those of you that are watching online, if you want to send questions in, you can do that um, through the online uh, source or through Teens Design, uh, which is the Twitter hashtag. Okay, everybody set? Okay. So first step is, Make some notes as a group, either you can think as individually in your own community or you can you know, talk it out amongst yourselves. Um, what would that design problem be? Is the problem one that teens can relate to on a daily basis? Is the problem real world and authentic? Does it have parameters? And can you identify a client who could, who could actually provide feedback down the road? So take a few moments. Jot some, jot some answers down to those, and then look at step two also. What places will you visit with them that 
uh, a place that can help them see other inspiring examples of design solutions or a particular building type, what background info will they need to collect, and what info will you need to supply them with. So take a few moments, we'll do this about, uh, about three minutes, four or four minutes or so for this, and we'll move on to the next step. So just a small discussion.
Okay, we need to move on. So let's look at steps three, four, and five here. Think about brainstorming ideas, developing solutions, and getting feedback. So these kinds of questions that you might ask yourself or ask with the group are, what physical materials are available for use by teens um, in this stage? Can, like, you know, do you get old foam core? Do you get old uh, cereal boxes? Do you get, what can your firm provide? What resources can you recycle? In the developing solutions, maybe what technical skills are you thinking that you might want to teach the kids or help them explore? This could be photography or various software or writing. Writing is so key, so, so important for this age group. They don't like to write, and we know that um, written communication is, is still very important. Um, model making skills, etc. And then think about step five. What is that way that students will share their work in an ongoing way so that it's not just the sort of ta-da at the end, but that is there a place where you can display their work at your firm and leave it up over a week to week or, or, or hour to hour or something like that? Or do you, do you have them do a quick and dirty WordPress press blog and post their work? Or um, a Tumblr site? Or do you use discoverdesign.org and, and have them sort of share their ongoing work? How will you and the other mentors provide that ongoing feedback? How will they provide peer-to-peer -peer feedback? And how will a student sort of step back and self-evaluate the work that they have done? So think about those kinds of things and maybe have a discussion. And then we'll, we'll, we'll um, kind of look to the last step and, and share out. Hey people, while that's going on, I just wanted to say hello from Big Time Small Firm and um, go to the screen share and show you our interface on Google Plus. Uh, no way for us to pass the time since we're not participating in the uh, group session there. Uh, this is the Google Plus interface for our community, small community on the, that social network there. So here you can see some of the posts I've been tearing it up this morning, simulcasting these sessions from the AIA um, convention. Uh, but during normal times, we have people posting uh, examples of their work. We have our bi-weekly hangouts every uh, couple Friday afternoon. Uh, people post work that they find interesting, work that they have going on in their own firm. Uh, people connect on here to contract uh, with each other and provide support services, whether it be in specifications or uh, CAD or planning or what have you. Um, just a good little community for people to post uh, things that we know being uh, architectural um, firm practitioners that would be interesting to each other and, and maybe put, uh, put somebody else to sleep. The left side of the screen here has the categories in which you can post. Uh, they're all pretty self-explanatory. Uh, there's a couple here I want to point out that I'm trying to highlight, one of which is the portfolio showcase. Uh, please don't be shy to come share your work with us. Uh, it's good to inspire each other and educate each other about the new things that we're trying and uh, discuss project issues that can help us uh, all learn from each other's experiences and mistakes and uh, successes. Uh, and I mentioned earlier about contracting. I have a couple of uh, sections here called Consultant Specialists and Freelance Partnership, where big time small firm members can connect with each other on those channels. So uh, there you see it, uh, quite proud of our little community here, we have 37 members so far, and I guess we have about a core group of participating, probably eight to 12 members that uh, come on a regular basis uh, and post things. 
And I wanted to say thank you to Bill Peska for uh, moderating this group with me. He keeps me out of trouble. If I get stuck at a job site meeting and, and can't come to a hangout later or something, he'll start it up and, and make sure that uh, things run smoothly. Uh, but it's it's a fun thing we've got going here. Uh, this was a spinoff from Mark LePage's Entrepreneur Architect. Uh, we got the idea in one of his uh, Twitter chats that he used to do on Wednesday night, Entrepreneur Architect chat. And uh, the next day, I just got onto Google Plus and started it up. And uh, that was, um, I don't know, probably about six or eight months ago, uh, right before he, uh, he stopped doing the, the Twitter chat and started focusing on some of his other endeavors. So I guess they'll probably be going back to the uh, session here in a little bit. So I'll get back on that screen share. Uh, thanks again for watching. And uh, thanks to the AI for doing the virtual convention. I've enjoyed participating this way. I thought it would have been nice to be in uh, Denver, Colorado. This will be a good virtual substitute. Okay, so let's look advantage. at the last uh, sort of uh, questions here. In terms of step six, in terms of thinking about presenting this final design, think a little bit about where the students might present their work. Um, is it a place that maybe they can't normally visit that's a special place that um, you can sort of raise the, the level of um, making them feel special that you're maybe inviting them into a, a new space? Oh, that's also comfortable. Also, who are they presenting to? Um, I think that's really important. Is this panel that they're presenting to in terms of their final design, is it a panel made up of people who have a true stake in the outcome, either of the proposed or hypothetical design decisions? And lastly, we just have a list of sort of logistical things that you might think about um, to sort of, if you, if you aren't working with teams now or you're thinking about uh, it in the future, are you working through a school or classroom setting? Are you partnering with a local school or is this an after school program? Where will the teens gather? Is it easily accessible to them? Can they get there on their own after school? Or do they, you know, if, if you're far away and they have to need somebody to drive them, you might, you know, have fewer numbers. Um, who is going to work with the teens? How will you recruit these mentors? Will the students work in teams or as, individual, in, as individuals? We, we would recommend teams, but sometimes if you have fewer, it might, individuals might make sense. What technology is available to them? If you're having them use computers, you know, do you have extra spare computers at your office that they can use or, or laptops? And if not, then you're going to have to think about sort of a plan B. And the last question is not, not do you feed them? The question is, what will you feed them? <laughs> Teenagers are hungry, hungry, hungry. And especially at the end of the day, as Sarah talks about, they feed them after school. You know, they, they've been up, the first period was at 7 a.m. They've gone through a whole day of classes. They're starving, and they're not going to be able to think or be creative if their stomachs are hungry. So, um, so some last things to think about, and then we'll quickly share out before we, as we end as we wrap up.
try another little fun thing here while they're in their group session. Okay, let's um, ask a couple of these groups to talk a little bit about anyway, speaker, about some things that um, that they've been thinking about. Um, can I ask this group over here, uh, sir, in the black jacket? You talked about sort of this premise that I think we need to important to talk about about defining the problem too early and what that means. Can you talk a little bit about what you were mentioning? I just, I've done a lot of consulting with other architects in other parts of the country doing sort of design facilitation. And, and I think the thing that I've learned is that a lot of times the question you start with predetermines the direction of the project. And so rather than talking about designing a school, for example, mm -hmm. our first question is let's talk about how we learn and other examples of where we learn so that when you start to ask uh, in, in the sort of critique phase, you're not asking about why they put this next to that in terms of the kind of spaces, the, the biology room next to the whatever. It's how does this impact how we learn? And so it makes it a much easier question for them to answer because they have the right. why of right. why they're doing it. Yeah. And, and a kid, if they only know, if you're designing schools, for example, as their starting point, they really, they know this building, but they probably only know that building in their elementary school, and they haven't maybe seen a wide variety of really maybe good models. Maybe the one that they're in is kind of crummy. And so you need to sort of expand that notion of that it's not just about a building with a label of school on it, but it's about a place that we learn, and what are those different ways that we learn, and do and uh, do those learning <coughs> modes, and, and really getting to that. So that, yes, there's the why behind it. Yeah. Okay. Any other things you heard when you were listening, sort of to that early defining the problem, um, collecting information? Okay. No, we'll, we'll need, need the microphone. The, the online segment will need you. Sometimes I think it's good to show them what not to do. <laughs> okay. <laughs> you know, maybe bad examples, and uh, you know, you can also learn from from that kind of experience too. Mm -hmm. Anything else, Ed, that you heard that no. maybe okay? Here's, here's a comment yeah. over here from Tom. Yeah. Our little group came up with uh, an a interesting revelation uh, that it's not scale is the issue, but it's complexity. That uh, the, the kids like scale. They like doing big things, but don't get it complicated. Yeah. Um, don't try to do a hospital. Don't right. try to do an airport. Yeah. Do if they, if they want to do big. Um, uh, we did a museum. Museum is reasonably sized. Um, uh, you know, few thousand square feet. But the functions are clearly defined, and the relationships can be explored, mm -hmm. and that sort of thing. And that's kind of the level that they can they can grasp pretty easily. Yeah, um, that's a good point. Uh, Ace this year uh, national level had a, a home retrofit as a project that the kids decided they wanted to do, mm -hmm. and it the complexity was much higher than the museum the year before, and. They struggled a bit because they did. They thought it sounded like a good project, but as you were saying, it, it, it's not the first question of how do you modify the home, but how do you live? And and they started to learn about what happens when your knees go out, and what happens when you can't see as well, and what you know other issues that had nothing to do with the home. That reflected in the final design, and that was that was eye-opening to them. And the final solution, especially the cost, was eye-opening to me. <laughs> so uh, the big thing I think we came out with was the complexity. Yeah. Keep the complexity down. The scale is not the problem. 
And I think it, all these sort of things point to um, our role as designers to be process oriented and not product oriented necessarily. Like that, that's not our goal is, is a new hospital or a new school, but, but to get the kid to start to think through those, those why questions and um, so they can break down that complexity in, 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 a, in a logical way, in a meaningful way. They, as I said at the beginning, the you know, most, most common things we hear from kids is, they just, what do I do next? I, I don't know what to do next. What question do I ask? What am I supposed to do What am I supposed to do next? And, and if you can sort of um, chunk it out for them, not to say that, that there's necessarily an A to B solution. It might be, as we saw with that diagram, really messy for a while. But at least that you're sort of driving towards something um, that can break down that complexity. complexity. So, yeah. Okay, um, let's look at this next section here. Um, other thoughts on sort of this stage of the process in terms of brainstorming, um, like physical uh, materials or technology that you might use, feedback, any things you want to say? Yeah. I, I work with a, a small organization and we do a lot of different project-based learning activities that don't necessarily focus on architecture, but mm -hmm. um, have that sort of 21st century learning skills at their core. Mm -hmm. And we, my my found the founder of the organization and myself, we both have architecture educations, and we've brought sketchbooking as a, a, a focus in all of the activities. So we provide a small sketchbook for every student, and then. Great really try to get them to use the sketchbook for e even just a sentence, two sentences, one small sketch before they move on to the next step in, in any activity um, to really start to build that, that feedback loop of mm -hmm. developing your idea, thinking it through, working through it, and then finally presenting it back to the group and sort of learning from your process. So you can see where you started and where you finished. And kind of, we always talk about closing that loop. Mm -hmm. That's great. Yeah, I think that's really important for kids. It's also a progress sort of thing to see, you know, what, what I did last week, what I did yesterday. Um, somebody said, as a parent, you, you, he's learned not to ask, how was your day at school? Because <laughs> the, the kid won't say anything. But <laughs> instead, you know, tell me one thing you learned. And, and the sketchbook does do that, help with that. So um, we need to wrap up, um, I think, uh, here, just to... Um, these are our objectives that we hoped to um, get to today. Opportunities for you to engage with this K-12 audiences, um, the connections between what's happening in project-based learning in schools and your design thinking. Hopefully we've given you some techniques and tools and strategies um, and ways to then also connect with us. There's um, a handout that's online that includes a bibliography of things today, um, an article, the, the report that Ed mentioned uh, that includes like, the breakdown of students, um, an article on Discover Design, um, some other resources there that you can find online. And we'll be around to answer questions, questions at, the end, at the end. So, yes. Um, to this session, then you can click on the handout. If you go back to SA 205. Yes, SA, SA 205 is, is, this hand, is this session. So, anyway, thank you all for coming. Thank you. Thank you.